All right, getting back into it in Unity Day 3. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, some of the uh, other features of Unity, and um, I think that uh, I might have hit on some of these in the past few lectures, but uh, still, it's a good refresher to go over this a couple of times, and we'll also be getting into some of the uh, rigid body stuff in Unity that lets you do the physics, um, and also prefabs, which will let you sort of combine functionality and objects into one thing that then can be reused throughout your um, scene, game, experience, and, and beyond. And also we'll talk a little bit about particle systems, which uh, are a lot of fun and can add a huge dimension to uh, the experiences that you're building. Um, great, let's get into it. So start us off, let's get into lighting. And I might have already talked a little bit about this uh, in the past lecture, but there are a couple of different types of lights. And to be fair, uh, lighting is a huge topic in computer graphics, and so limiting it down to just a point light and a spotlight is probably insufficient. If you're interested in that stuff, uh, I highly recommend uh, checking out a career in uh, computer graphics because that's all computer graphics really is, is representing how objects interact with light um, of, of different kinds. But for the time being, let's just talk a little bit about uh, point lights and spotlights. So a point light is an effective point in space that sends out light equally in all directions. Um, because of this point, you can kind of imagine you've got a point here, and this distance is longer than this distance, right? And so the equations for determining that distance um, and how light falls off based on distance will ultimately give you the fall off. Uh, usually it's an inverse uh, squared fall off, like 1 over r squared, but you'll find that in most games uh, you tend to play with that a little bit. Uh, it's not physically accurate, but it looks a lot better because lighting is such a hard thing to do and making an, uh, an experience and an environment look good. Um, often you kind of tend towards the artistic versus the physically accurate. Um, but there are ways to do physically accurate lighting as well um, with other techniques that we will probably not talk about in this course. Um, what's really nice about point lights is they're really good for effects like somebody, uh, you know, lighting a fire in the middle of a dark field or uh, perhaps, um, you know, an explosion or a little, you know, uh, street lamp or something. Uh, these are sort of uh, local type of um, lighting effects because as you can even see in uh, the screenshot here, the light falls off relatively quickly and so you get kind of this area of, of lighting but it sort of goes away. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's very good for that kind of stuff. Um, a spotlight is similar to a directional light, uh, but it has a sort of constrained, um, this constrained uh, field of view, really, uh, that it has. Um, like a point light, it does sort of fall off. Again, you've got that kind of, um, you know, that distance squared thing. Uh, and uh, this is different than uh, the directional light that we've been using up until now in the environment because the spotlight A constrains to a specific cone, so it kind of creates a spot like, outside of that, um, and uh, also it has a fall-off. Whereas a directional light does not have a fall-off, um, a directional light is almost like imagine the sun, every point on the earth is... Uh, basically the same distance from the sun by a very, very small margin of error if you think about the math. And so in that sense, every point in a directional light is equally distant from that point light. And so the only thing that really matters there is the angle of the light. Whereas in a spotlight, you do have a distance, um, right? So that's the general thing. In theory, you can make a directional light out of a spotlight. You'd have to make the spotlight super, super bright <laughs> uh, and, and uh, very far away. But uh, that's, you know, just kind of turning one thing into the other. You, you should just use the approximation breakdowns instead. Um, so yeah, those are the two lights that we'll see the most of probably in this, um, in this class. And just in general, uh, point light, spotlights, and direction lights get you pretty 
far. Uh, there are area lights, we're not going to talk about those. Um, I, I, don't, I do not believe so. So, uh, this is something that uh, should be brought up, and right after this I'll, I'll rev up my own Unity instance so that we can kind of check this stuff out live. Um, so, to save on time, um, Unity will generate light maps. And light maps are uh, ways, they're, they're effectively, and this gets a little bit more technical than we probably need to know, so, but just so you, for your information, uh, light maps are like textures that are then saved um, and then look, used. So instead of calculating the light for every position on an object when you're rendering it, instead you are uh, basically rendering a texture on top of that. And so it's much, much faster. Uh, it does cost memory, but these days memory is not the main problem <laughs> uh, unless you're you know, doing certain things in, in large, large scale games. But for the kinds of applications you guys will be building, most likely not for some time. Um, now, when you're developing these experiences, you don't care so much about how they look uh, in that moment. You care about how they look when people use it, but not necessarily when you're working on it. And uh, generating light maps can be quite expensive. Uh, you can kind of see the difference between the uh, image here with the light map baked in and with what, without the light map. Um, the quality of the shadows and things like that. Uh, Unity will use some pretty advanced um, you know, uh, ambient occlusion techniques and other lighting techniques or global illumination that we haven't discussed. Uh, but these do take up a lot of performance uh, to do real time, especially as you're changing things. So you can turn these off. So let me, um, before we move any, go any farther, let me jump in and rev up my uh, Unity as well here. Oops, wrong key, apparently. All right, that works. Uh, yeah, so let's pop up Unity here. And while it's loading, I can say that I should have covered this slide while that, great. So now it's loaded, um, you'll notice that we have a couple different projects here from last week when we were messing, out, messing around with this stuff. So let's go ahead and open up that snowman demo that we were working on. And, great. Cool. So, here we are. We're back in our very exciting scene. Um, last time I did talk a little bit about lights, but let's do that again just for kicks. So let me add in a point light, and you'll notice that the point light's right here above the snowman. And you'll notice that there's a bit of a, you know, light, uh, highlight there. If I move it, you can see in the game view as well that um, things are, are changing. Let me really emphasize this by uh, effectively turning off the sun. So now we're in, you know, the Arctic winter. In the, the, I don't know what to call it. Anyways, so you can see that point light moving around and objects reacting to its position. Um, obviously if it goes underneath, and this is kind of an important thing about point lights and, and shadows and so on, you'll notice that the objects are still illuminated even though this thing is under the ground. And I think it's important for you guys to realize, like, these are not physics lights. Um, if you put an object between them, unless it casts a shadow, unless you explicitly turn those features on, they will not uh, occlude, especially with, with regards to backwards geometry. And to get point lights to cast a shadow, um, I can show you how to do that some other time during office hours if you would like to ask. Uh, so, okay, if I change this light, you can see over here on the right in the inspector, um, we can change the, uh, the light to a directional light. Um, oops, so not directional, we don't want directional, we want a spotlight, sorry. And then if I put that up there and then rotate it, the other way, great, All right, let me go here, let's rotate it down, if I 
Okay, so you'll notice now that it doesn't actually cast any light. So what's the deal with that? Well, that's because it's far away, and like we said, it has a fall off. As we get closer and closer, you'll notice that that spotlight, and let's zoom in a bit if, if that helps. Right, you can see that light getting brighter. Um, there are ways to increase the angle. You can do that here, right? You can make it really wide. Eventually it gets uh, to be kind of like a half, almost turns like a spotlight, uh, to a point light. Um, you can also increase the range. The range will increase the intensity of that effectively, right? And as you increase the angle, great. So a lot of ways to play, only one way to win. Let's delete that for now and turn our light, our sun back on. Great. And let's go back to in a perspective. Cool. So let's talk about, let's show, let's go through this and turn um, off the auto generation of lighting. So to do that, all you have to do is you go to the window lighting settings. Where are we? General lighting settings. Great. I can go and park this here. So in the future, I can have it again. And well, I guess it's off by default in 2019. Um, but you can also turn on auto generate and it'll, it'll do that. We can actually see this happen. Uh, this won't really matter that much, will it? Because we don't really have any, <laughs> any real um, shadows or anything like that. But at least now uh, you know how to do it. So let's turn that off. Great. So let's jump into a little bit of the physics system uh, and talk about what rigid bodies are and how to assign uh, objects colliders. So this will be cool. So um, when you add a uh, you know a primitive like we were doing to create the snowman out of uh, 3D spheres, the um, the primitives are automatically created with a collider. So let's go check that out. If we add a new sphere, let's put that up here, and um, if we hit play. Right, nothing happens. Why does that? Why does nothing quite happen? Um, and that's because this sphere, while it has a collider, does not have a rigid body. We'll talk about what that is, but you can notice here that when I turn off the sphere collider, if I go fit to there, the green will go away. It's a, it kind of gets dulled out because the that's uh, no longer um, active. In fact, you can kind of go here and, and change all of the uh, different gizmos that are turned on. So you can, um, so for example, if we, ah, I won't do that now. Um, great. You can actually change the type of collider if you want, or you can change the position. You can change the size, which we don't really want to do. Um, you can also add a different collider, which we'll, we may um, talk about later. You can also, yeah, you can see, you can even move the position of it so you can make kind of objects that don't physically, like that act differently than their actual physical counterparts. Um, right. So, like I said, the um, size of the collider can change. Uh, you. Uh, can have you know these basic um, you know uh, three different colliders like a box, a sphere, and a capsule. Fortunately, there's no built-in cylinder collider, um, and you can also add these like specialized wet mesh wheel and terrain uh, um, colliders. Like for example, the terrain has a collider that is automatically built over that heat uh, the, that height map that we were doing last lecture. Uh, you can, if you import a mesh, then the collider of the mesh will be the exact triangles. Uh, but keep in mind that that's quite expensive, like to do all of those collision calculations for uh, at the mesh level. And then a, uh, you also have the wheel collider, which is used for for vehicles. So yeah, that's um, 
maybe something that we'll see pretty soon. So notice when I uh, hit play, nothing quite happened. I was able to, you know, land with my with my guy and walk around. But that's about it. Um, you know, that that sphere is up there, and we're like, why is it up there? It should fall down. So how do we how do we uh, get that to do so? The way you do that is the rigid body component that you can attach. And so this is going to be the first time that we're going to add a component to uh, something like this. And so we're going to go and we're going to add component. And we're going to search for rigid body. Great. And now you'll notice just by doing that, this will fall when I hit play. Cool. And it's kind of a boring, boring fall, but it, it does do something. And we can even go up to it and kind of poke it. Make it, make it, you know, roll, roll off into the distance infinitely. Pretty fun. So already we've got stuff that's moving around. Uh, the rigid body system works directly with the collider and enables the physical behavior. Uh, it's, you know, already included as you noticed in that first-person character controller. So when we bumped into stuff, uh, you'll actually see this if I go and I fit to our first-person character controller which it won't let me do for whatever reason. Um, right, okay. But you'll notice if I click here, there, that green collider there is, I don't know if you can quite see it, uh, but that green collider is a uh, capsule style collider. And if you scroll down here, um, you'll notice this rigid body uh, as well with specific kind of collision detection and so on um, and that's quite a that, that's how it accomplishes that and if you look into here you'll see another object and we'll talk about what this means uh, in a second great so you know when you add a rigid body it adds physics to that object so that gives it the ability to interact with the scene and other objects that are rigid bodies as well or that have colliders, really, we should say, specifically, because you'll notice that the terrain doesn't fall into infinity, but when we fall into it, it does collide with us. And so uh, collider and rigid body are two different things. Um, this is an important topic, and it's a whole subject in of itself, but uh, the results are going to be different um, when you run calculations for physics and collision uh, each time you run the game. But we're not saying that every time you drop a ball, it's going to like fly off in different directions if it hits an object. It's generally going to fly off in the same direction, but the exact calculation, and I mean at the um, very, very small number scale, will be slightly different. And that might not seem like a big deal, because if you're playing a game, you're making it for, your, for one person. But if you're saying like making a multiplayer game where multiple people are doing stuff together over a network, uh, on different computers, this is where those things can really add up because you can imagine one calculation, the error might be pretty small, but uh, we're doing this physics calculation every 10 to 20 milliseconds usually in a physics system and that adds up quite quickly to the point where two people may kick a ball and they might it might be off by a few centimeters and another, another kick and another kick and by the middle of the game after 15 minutes the two users are seeing completely different things. So this is a whole subject in of itself, how to create deterministic physics systems or how to create systems that sort of lock to each other. And that's a really fun subject, actually. Um, cool. So yeah, the, the rigid body will take over the movement of a game object. So it uses forces uh, and then it uses the physics to calculate that, which can be really fun to create certain kinds of controllers, right? Like if you've ever played a racing car game, it's a really uh, clever technique to make a racing car uh, using just a rolling ball rigid body and collider and nothing else, right? So the physics for a car can be really complicated but can be very, very directly comparable to just a rolling ball with physics um, forces of being applied to it. It's, like, it's quite fun. Um, however, it means that if you're trying to do very specific animations and you want to make this object go from here to here in a very direct and linear way, you might not be able to do that, and you might have to turn off rigid. Like, there's a lot of kind of scripting that will get involved into making that possible. So, yeah. But physics is quite um, fun and dynamic, right? You can have 
like a billiard table and you can make a game like a billiard game. Uh, you can make things explode, you can make things kind of behave erratically, which actually for a, a game and an interactive experience is a positive, not, not necessarily a, a negative. Um, so when you load an object from a disk or not something that's just made up of uh, primitives, they, were in, they will not come with a collider or, or a rigid body by default. So this is a bit of a decision you will have to make. Either you want to do it at the um, mesh layer like we were talking about, but that can be quite expensive to calculate that. You'll find that even in some of the best computers, if you're doing mesh level uh, collision calculations, and we can talk about those uh, on, in office hours if you'd ever like to you know, explore what um, some of the more you know, interesting collision um, uh, algorithms are. For example, there's what's called GJK, uh, Gilbert Johnson, and I forgot what the K stands for, but it's quite uh, a, a very eloquent uh, algorithm to determine the collisions of arbitrary meshes. Uh, also VClip, which was one that was actually developed by Nissan, believe it or not, uh, and it was like patented to the teeth up until recently the patent ran out, and so it's available, but actually GJK and what's called the expanding um, uh, polytope algorithm are, are a little bit better. And so those are really fun um, uh, subjects to explore, but short, so short story is the collision uh, is cheapest with a sphere, and then a bounding box that is aligned to the axes, and then an oriented bounding box is the, the most expensive of the primitive uh, cal uh, calculations. And then like a capsule and a cylinder kind of in the middle there because you can sort of do a bit of both. And so you can kind of see, but once you get to an arbitrary mesh, it's really, really expensive. So you really want to um, justify when you're doing this, right? For example, this uh, snowman uh, model, I think this is from that movie, that I should uh, I should know of, but I don't. Uh, anyways, it the, you could sort of um, approximate this one with just a capsule, or if you wanted more detail and you want, say, the the arms to not respond, uh, to to not you know expand your your model to just having this one cylinder, you could have a, a com combination of smaller primitives to kind of contain it. Because at the end of the day, why is it really important that that finger on his hand collides, but the space in between does not? Now you might have a really good justification for it, right? If that's the case, great. But if it's just a, you're gonna make a pile of these guys and they're just gonna fall on top of each other and kind of create a pile, like what's the point of creating a really, really accurate uh, physics simulation? So really keep in mind that that is a, a big trade-off that uh, I think isn't obvious to uh, people early on when they start getting into uh, doing real-time physics simulation. Um, right, so let's kind of play around with this. We don't have any rigid bodies on our um, snowman. So what if we added that? So let's uh, choose, let's see here, Jim, or right, that's Bob. Let's go, let's go hang out with Bob for a second. Um, obviously it's not going to let me, either. great. So these spheres, the, the head, the middle and the bottom currently do not have any colliders. So what if we added one? Well, we have a collider and you'll notice that in the head, the collider has already taken on the, um, the, the everything, right? You can see there's a green on not just the, the sphere itself, but on the whole thing, on the hat as well. So you can kind of see when you combine primitives with their, with their sort of um, colliders that you get this sort of composite collider, which is a very, very powerful um, way to do it. So let's say we add a rigid body to the sky. And then what will happen? Just, just you know, we'll see. The head will fall off, right? Because there's nothing holding it there, really, except for, um, well, before, nothing. It was just there was no physics calculation to keep it from from doing that. But if we add it to the others as well, let's let's add it to the body, to the middle, and to the bottom. And now, if we do that, then this whole thing will explode. Nice. Why did it explode? Well, if you look uh, very carefully, you'll notice that. Here, let's uh, go into isometric mode and then take a look from 
the this angle. You'll notice that there, there is a display, like a kind of a collision, like a bit of um, intersection in so between the head, the middle, and the bottom. You'll notice that if I push this in a bit lower, um, you'll notice that the head will pop up way, way more aggressively. And there it goes. And the reason for that is in real life, uh, things don't actually intersect that way. I mean, obviously things collide and crunch and uh, deform and yada, yada, yada. But all of those things are physic, like physical actions that uh, conserve energy. So right now, the physics simulation is seeing two objects that are inside of each other. And it's like, that's not conserving energy. There's clearly a lot of latent energy in that situation. It's actually quite a simple um, uh, calculation. What it does is it figures out what's the minimum amount of distance that one object needs to uh, go to get to, to no longer be colliding. And then that distance times the masses and so on, and you can figure out the, the latent energy in that sort of collision, in that, in that sort of like compression. Uh, you can also notice that the bottom is, uh, also has uh, uh, this uh, constraint. So while the, the head is trying to go up, the middle is trying to go down, but then it's got the bottom that's you know, basically pushing it back up again. And so you've got this whole sort of, in that little moment of that initial calculation, a lot of energy is being generated and created, uh, which is not conserving energy. Um, so again, it's a really good point to, uh, thing to bring up that these things are not perfect. Um, so let's, uh, let's do this, for example, if I move this guy so that it's just going to do that. In theory, based on what I just said, and so if I'm wrong, uh, I don't know what I'll do, but in theory, the bottom should go get pushed down, hit that bottom sphere, and then the top one will still pop off because of that compression between the head and the body. There you go. Cool. So a lot of fun with this stuff. You can probably do a lot of, you know, just spend half an afternoon playing with it, which we're not going to do. Um, great. So yeah, as, uh, as I was saying, this is uh, how you can make these things explode. Uh, but we don't want them to explode, right? At, at first, we want them to kind of be there and not be mad at us. So when we start coding, which we'll do uh, in the next lecture, not this one, uh, we'll fix this because we'll be able to, like I said earlier in this lecture, kind of turn things on and turn things off uh, depending on what we want. So one of the ways that we do this uh, or at least make it a little bit easier for us, and not just this specifically, but in general, uh, we use a thing that Unity has developed called a prefab. Uh, a prefab is a kind of asset. Um, you notice already we have these three uh, objects. Let's, uh, let's go back to a normal view here. All right. Let's see some, you know, see here. Let's go to... That's our center point. Let's delete this guy because we don't need it. Um, you notice we have three of these objects, but they're all sort of the same, right? They're a little bit different in certain ways, but not in any substantial ways. So and a, a prefab is a way for us to take all of that content, uh, all of those objects, and sort of store them in a way that can then be reused, and also not just reused in our, you know, in our given scene, but multiple scenes in the um, application, but also across applications in the future. And so it's really, really helpful because it lets you keep all the components and attributes. Uh, when you change one, like we saw with the material, uh, it'll change all of them in the same way. And uh, you can also override individual um, settings still. So you, you kind of have this maximum flexibility in, in whatever you want to do. And so uh, let's, uh, let's apply just to kind of show you, let's apply a prefab here. So to create a prefab, you really can just write um, or click. Oh, that's right. You don't actually have to do any of that. You just go, let's put them here. So this is our prefab folder. 
right? And we can just, there you go. So now we've got Jin in our prefab folder. Uh, it's, not, it's actually that easy. You don't actually have to do anything. And now if I wanted to add more prefabs, I can just da, 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 populate it, right? Um, I forget, is Jim the one with our, yes, so Jim is the one with, with our crazy um, physics system, right? So let's see what happens Oops. when we do that. We'll all explode, right? Nope. It's not. I see. Jim was not our guy. Bob was. So let's do that. Let's let's add Bob to our prefabs and add a bunch of Bobs in here. Cool. And now when we hit play, uh, we expect all of those to explode. Cool. Party. Um, now what's, what's really po powerful about prefabs is that now I can go into here um, and I can open the prefab and go into the individual components here and I can actually turn off or I can delete, I guess. I can, well, let's just do this. I can... Um, I can turn off the collider. That'll the the collider. Well, you know what? Let me just do it the way, a simple way. Just like remove component from the head. Let's remove the component from the middle. Uh, let's remove the component from the bottom. And now, um, when I go back to my scene, somehow great. Hopefully, if this worked well, none of them will explode. And why is that? Because I've changed the underlying prefab, which means that all the bobs no longer have that component that we had. If you'll notice, all of them do not have the um, rigid body prefab. And so Bob was the one we just changed, but let's say we want to blow up every gym. So we go and we open up the prefab and we add a component rigid body. Well, I don't want to do it at the top level, actually. I want to do it at the head, right? At the middle. And at the bottom. Great. And now we go back to our scene. And then when we play, play, the, uh, the, the gyms will blow up, not the bobs. Cool. That's what we expected. Fun. Uh, <laughs> great. So, prefabs are really powerful. They're not just for adding Collider and all these things. Actually, the, the thing you'll notice, the one prefab we've been using this whole time that's exceptionally useful is this first-person controller. Uh, and you'll notice in the first-person controller, we've got a camera. And we've also got uh, a, um, a rigid body and a Collider somewhere. But I always forget where they put the collider for this thing. Um, and there's also other stuff in here, which we'll talk about, right? Like audio effects and uh, this script that is, um, is, is, where does that script go? Like what's going on? We'll talk about those uh, actually in the next lecture. So stay tuned. Great. Let's have a little bit of fun stuff. Um, we Particle systems, like I was saying, are a very uh, powerful effect. I mean, you've, you've seen particle systems probably in every game you've ever played. Uh, very few of them don't use it. Some of them use it to pretty um, subtle effects like creating uh, smoke and atmospheric things. Um, some use it for like really outrageous, uh, especially in RPGs and uh, games that are about like people with swords that are bigger than they are and, and whatever. Um, particle systems are used to create these like really wacky, like bright things that um, that, that that are really attention uh, grabbing. I think they're uh, particularly helpful in that they're quite random. They're very stochastic in nature. You have this sort of source, and these things are flying out everywhere. And uh, as far as an artist goes, like it's you know when you're making a game where you can't really quite predict what's going on, like this user may be here or here or there. Who knows, right? So 
the um, it, it's quite nice to have a, uh, an effect that can kind of react dynamically to a lot of different scenarios, and, and particle systems are um, the go-to for something like that. So, um, cool. Let's uh, let's do it. You know, it's probably the best way to do it is just to add one. So let's go and add a particle system. Again, to do that, you add a uh, object, and we will do. I guess it's an effect now, particle system. Great. And you'll notice it's already spitting out these um, these guys, these, uh, these particles. And you'll see that it's uh, in here. Uh, if I'm clicking on it, it'll be live. If I'm not clicking on it, it won't be. So here you can kind of see it's highlighting for you all of those objects in the camera view. Uh, that's I guess right above my head. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's it's going to show you what that looks like from the game perspective. Uh, and you notice these, these objects right now are uh, they look kind of two D, and that's sort of on purpose. They do have a three D position, but the way they're rendered generally a two D thing. You can change that. There's a lot of different ways to make particles work, um, but it's a bit more performant when the the particles are actually rendered as a two D thing, uh, as a sprite, so to speak. Um, so let's kind of play with the effects a little, the, the style. Right now it's only sending particles upward, which is okay, but we probably want it to do different things. So um, let's pre-warm it, which I'm not entirely sure what that does, but uh, let's change the start size to 0.2. So now the particles are smaller. Let's change the... Um, the uh, simulation space to world. And let's increase the maximum particles to 10,000, which will give us way more particles, uh, but, but actually not that much more immediately because uh, right now we're not, the speed of uh, emission is quite low. Uh, so we have to increase the emission speed to uh, a much higher number. Um, let's let's go down to emission. Right, right over time is now ten. So let's add, uh, increase that to a thousand. Boom! That is lots of particles. Cool. You can see that it kind of the source is like a bit of a almost like a you know disc in a way. So that's pretty cool. Um, and now let's change the shape of that, that emitter. Uh, so first we're going to change the shape of the, uh, of the emitter, as we're seeing here. So like I was saying, it's a bit of a cone right now. Let's make it into a box. Now it's going to be this nice big box, which is pretty cool. Especially good if we're trying to make like a river or a flow of some kind. And then we're going to increase every, the, um, the sizing of everything to, um, a different scale, just like we were doing previously. So we're going to change it to 40, 40, and 10. Right. Now that's cool. It almost looks like it's snowing, but backwards. So we need to rotate it, right? And you can rotate this, like I was moving it already in here. Uh, you can rotate it manually, or you can rotate it um, on your own. And now you'll notice that it is snowing. Very cool. In fact, we can make it snow a little bit more aggressively if we move a bit lower. Um, but really, it's, it's perfect. Pretty fun. Um, so this is a nice little hack. You'll notice that if I zoom out, it's not really snowing everywhere, is it? You know, like if I move this here, it'll snow, and then it stops snowing. Now this is cool if you want to make some kind of like physics, uh, like a game where you're in a particular place and it starts to snow, and now it doesn't snow anymore, right? But the truth is to say we we really want to do this. Um, at the camera level. So what we can do is we can 
take the particle system um, as a component and drag it into the first person uh, character uh, prefab. And uh, we'll, we'll attach it to the camera itself. Not, not that it matters too much because the whole thing is moving, but uh, we probably want to be really explicit. So this is the camera and let's move it in there. And also let's kind of give it, a, the Y makes sense, but we don't really want to offset it too much from our camera. So now you'll notice that it's right on top of our camera. If we move it back to, you'll see in orthographic mode, you can see it's right on that. And if I hit play, you'll see it moving with me. So it's always snowing wherever I am. It's kind of funny that you can almost like outrun it a little bit. And so you can kind of see all the little bits uh, that you really have to pay attention to when you're making a game. Because like, if I, I can run away from the snow, want. <laughs> um, great. Oh, you'll actually notice too. <laughs> Maybe this is not intentional as well. As I move, as I look up and down, this will change as well. So we may need to do something unique there to do, to deal with that. And how do you do that? Um, will actually be covered more in the coding uh, section. So yeah, so now you know how to kind of add more interesting things to your uh, environment, uh, into your game. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of other stuff that um, Unity can do, obviously, but we're going to start to get into um, some of the more, uh, you know, uh, coding side in the next lecture. Okay. Great. So, a bit of homework, I guess. Uh, so, I, I'm adapting this course to online. Uh, I think this is the first time. I think I mentioned already it's the first time. I'm a little bit um, new at this and trying to figure it out. Uh, I'm still working through some of the lectures and making sure that the deadlines make sense. So, if you see a, le a deadline that doesn't make any sense, um, feel free to bring it up in the Discord. Free, feel free to say something. For the most part, I'm gonna try to aim for Tuesdays. Uh, and when it says in class, like I, I'm gonna try to fix the lectures to get rid of that stuff. So I apologize. But generally speaking, just go by what's uh, my courses is the the um, the the correct answer. If like you're worried about what's the the deadline, whatever. Um, if it's on my courses then that's what you should be going by. If it's not on my courses and it shows up in a lecture, please, like everybody else has been doing, uh, and thank you very much for doing so in the Discord, bring it up to me so I can fix that. Uh, and I'll never, like if, if something's not on, on there and it gets brought up to me a day before it's due, I, I will not expect you guys to do it in like 24 hours. Uh, so please bring it up as soon as you possibly can uh, if, there's not, if it's not there, uh, but if I screw up, Obviously, uh, I'm not going to hold it against anyone. So yeah, um, that's really it. And I'm going to stop the recording now and set up for the next lecture. Excited to get into the coding side of this stuff with you guys. So yeah, sweet.